Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight. We know that everyone is busy and uh, we want to get started. So I'm just going to quickly introduce myself. My name is Carrie Patton. I've lived in Medfield now for four years. Um, myself and Christina will sit head up the special programs in New in Town. And um, just yesterday, I found a tick on my daughter's leg, my 14 month old daughter. And of course, I went into hysterics and trying to flick it off of her. But um, we know this is such a big problem in Medfield. We're so happy you're here. Word of mouth, get, get it out there. Um, you're here to educate yourselves and your family, and that's great. So we thank you for all being here. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Lester Hartman, senior associate at Westfield Mansfield Pediatrics. He's been there since 1986. He has been on the Pediatric Physicians Organization at Children's Hospital Board of Directors for over eight years. Um, he's medical director of a clinic in Haiti and VP of the Haitian Organization Program for Education and Health. And in 2006, he initiated and presently chairs the Regional Lyme Committee. And those are just three little things that he does. You can go online and read more about him. Um, our second speaker is Chris Caldy. She's a member of the Regional Lyme Committee and recently appointed to chair the newly formed Med Medfield Citizens Lyme Disease Study Committee. She's a mom, a pet owner, a part-time event planner, and concerned citizen of Medfield. Dr. Hartman? Hello, everybody. Glad you could come out. I think the Red Sox game has already started, so I always appreciate it when people can uh, come out for things while the uh, Red Sox are playing. Spring is here. As I always say, the Cardinals are out, fifth disease is here, and so is Lyme. So, um, and tonight, tonight I want to talk to you about um, Lyme disease, early diagnosis and detection. And that's what I'm going to focus on, because prevention is the key that Chris will discuss. So I'm going to focus on early detection and prevention, not so much on, on the controversies around treatment. I will talk about um, the basic treatment guidelines, um, but I'm not going to go into further details than that tonight. Um, why are we doing this? Why are people here? Um, and for one portion of the younger families, can you go to the next slide? We're here because of our children. Um, these are my two daughters, um, Sarah and Laura. Sarah's the one on your left, um, and Laura's the one on your right. And then this is Buttons, and this is Teddy. These are our dogs. Teddy has had Lyme. Buttons has not. Neither of my daughters have had Lyme. Um, um, you know, we live in Needham, so we're not quite as um, in, uh, in uh, conservation country as you are. Um, keep in mind, what I, I said, the main reason that um, Lyme disease is a problem here is because of the MCAS. Um, and people wonder, how did the MCAS have anything to do with Lyme disease? Well, remember, you were number one in the state the first year of the MCAS, okay? Um, and, and I'm hey, serious, I really think this is true. So what happens, where do people move to when they have young families? They move to the area with the best schools. And being number one in the MCAS, and coincidentally with a lot of conservation land, people moved in and, and then went into areas of um, um, you know, land where deer were. And as a result, there's a lot of lime around here, and I'll show you. Can I have the next slide? First, I want you to keep a little perspective about Lyme. Lyme is life-altering, mostly short-term, and it is not life-threatening, okay? This is a little boy in Haiti who has had typhoid fever, okay, um, and as I was walking through a hospital. Uh, can I have the next slide? This fellow right here has had, since I've known him, he's our uh, Haitian son, Richardson, he has had um, two bouts of malaria and two bouts of typhoid fever. And in fact, one of them, he walked five miles each way to school with fevers for one month um, before he was finally treated and had access to medical care. Next slide. This is a young lady who is at high risk for malaria as well. She lives in the little town where in Wampa. Um, we brought her down right after the earthquake. We were d down in Port-au-Prince five days after the earthquake start ended and uh, she was wandering the streets with nobody. She's developmentally delayed. Um, and our director, God bless her, brought her up and one of the families has taken her in um, um, and uh, cares for her. Um, but keep in mind perspective on this because we, as a public health mission, I think it's very important for me to impress upon you the importance of taking care of yourself and preventing Lyme disease. But by the same token, I don't want to instill too much fear 
as well. So there's a balance here with this. And I'll give you an example of me, for example, and I'm a little kooky sometimes. I, like um, Jenner, the smallpox vaccine fella, um, decided to vaccinate his child with it as an experiment first. Well, I, I wouldn't have done that. But um, I tried to infect myself several times with Lyme, getting myself about 15 bites, because I just wanted to see what it was like to have Lyme disease. Now, that sounds kooky. And it's, it's like the stunt man, you know, um, uh, don't do this, you know, yourself. And I never got it, okay? I never got it. And literally, I had 10, 15 bites. What I got was most Lyme disease, you can never fully remove the tick. Most of the ticks, you can never, the deer ticks, you can't remove. And as a result, um, there's always a little bit of the head left. And I had what's called a foreign body reaction for up to two months after that, and it was really annoying. I kind of wish I had the disease initially um, um, and treated myself afterwards. So next slide. So as I say, this is, this is a public health menace. It's not life-threatening. It can significantly alter lives for, for kids for several months. Keep in mind that 50% of people who are bitten with a deer tick will never have symptoms, okay? 50% will. But those people can go on to secondary disease, and we don't know who will and who won't. So it's very important to realize that people, it can be self-resolving in people as well. Um, in Medfield, though, if you, um, uh, during the summer, if a child has flu-like symptoms, fever, rash, and headache, the triad, okay, or fever, headache, and body aches, okay, flu-like symptoms in, in, the, in the summer. That is Lyme disease until proven otherwise, in my opinion, because there are very few other things in the winter. Sometimes Coxsackie, the hand, foot, and virus, mouth virus can start that, but there are very few things, and it is useless drawing blood work. Blood work in the early stages of Lyme is not reflective of a, a good diagnosis. It's not a reliable test at that point. Next slide, please. So let's look at what the um, life cycle of the deer tick is. First of all, the eggs are laid, and you should see a deer sometimes, thousands and thousands of eggs all around their eyes, their ears, and things. It's pretty gross looking, you know, in the spring. The larvae come out in the summer, and the nymphs as well, during this time period. And um, actually, the larvae come out in the summer, I apologize. These are very infectious at this time. These are the ones that can, um, the female, female larvae and nymphs, in fact, are the ones that are most inf uh, infectious um, 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 uh, of the, in the tick cycle. Next slide, please. So you can see here, the adult ticks, October through May, the nymphal tick, deer ticks, May to late July, and then the larval deer ticks. This is pretty much the area where they're the most infectious. So they say June, July, and August, but you'll see slides that go on both ends of that as well, and I'll show you some. Next. So this is the sense of the size. What I tell children is, if you get a new freckle on your body, tell your parent to look at it, because a lot of times a deer ticks, it's just a new freckle. It looks like a new freckle. Um, and, uh, and kids can, um, you know, do pick it up that way if, if they're taught to examine themselves. And... Uh, one of our members of the Regional Lyme Committee, Lisa Dolan, down in the audience, has a great saying that Chris is going to uh, mention later. Next slide. So here we are, Norfolk County. This is where we're from, we, we are. And if you look here at the data, all right, this was in 2009. That's the most recent data that we have here. Um, Norfolk County, frankly, had the, um, what is it, the, second highest number of case, total cases confirmed. And you always have to keep in mind that it's also part of the reporting because people may be reporting better. But the second largest number of cases and per 100,000 was about fifth in ranking, fifth or sixth in ranking in the number per 100,000 in the state of Massachusetts. Now, keep in mind that this covers a pretty broad swath of an area. If you go town by town, there is no question in my mind, and I'll show you some more data, that Medfield's the epicenter. Um, I mean, Dedham doesn't have Lyme disease, and that's in Norfolk County. So if you average these out, you'll see that we're in a huge area here between Dedham, Dover, Norfolk, and Westwood and parts of Walpole. Next slide. So number of confirmed cases in Massachusetts by month. This just confirms what was said before, May, June, July, and August. But 
You see here there's some, and here. So you have to remember this can be a year-round phenomenon. And I often have parents take down the tick shower cards that we gave you at the front there um, and say, oh, I take it down and I, um, you know, in, in, um, in October and I put it back up in April. And I say, no, 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 it needs to be up all the time to remind your child. So next slide. All right. So total number of cases of Lyme disease at Westwood Mansfield Pediatrics. In 2009, we had many more than in 2010. That doesn't mean anything. This is a cyclic issue. So one year is lower than the other. That doesn't mean things are, are happening. That um, means that it, the, the incidence is dropping. I don't know what this year is going to hold. I certainly am a little more concerned because of all the snow and the wet that we've had that we may have a worse year than we had last year for sure. Next slide, please. And then this is the winter data. Um, this year we had three cases. Um, year before we had two. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that because it was in the year where we had 100 cases, almost 90 cases we had. But, and one of them was a Lyme Spells palsy and another was um, um, a Lyme arthritis. Next slide, please. So if you look here, here is what um, total, total Westwood Mansfield pediatric patients by town. All right, so you see the towns here. You got Dover, we have 150 patients from Dover, 675 from Medfield, and 1,399 from Westwood. And Westwood's a larger town than Medfield. But what's interesting that you see is for, the same, for this population, there's 17 cases. For half the population, same population in Medfield, you have this, almost the same number of cases. So one can draw a conclusion that probably Medfield has twice the higher incidence of, um, from this data, the best I conclude is that Medfield has twice the um, incidence of Lyme disease that Westwood does. Um, next slide, please. And if you look at the cases by age, this is the distribution um, in the state. And you see the peaks here, all right, three to four. Then you have one at six. And then, this is us, actually, I'm sorry. Um, you have the um, three, wait a minute, the three to four, all right, the three to four range, we had a peak, which I found very interesting, seven, and then um, um, 11. But what I found interesting is, is this young kid's peak, because I was a little surprised at that this time. You know, parents at this age are usually bathing their children so they can see that, see the um, deer tick on their kids, because oftentimes they're bathing them every night or every other night. Well, one of the things I've also discovered now is, is look at your kids in their hair and feel in their hair. Sometimes you can't see if your child has a thick head of hair. You really have to feel at this age. And I'll show you some more um, slides, because I have one other thought about this. The next one, please. So if you look in, in the state, this does not correlate quite the same. Less than five is lower, five to seven, five to nine is a little bit higher. And then the incidence again goes up in the uh, 45 to about 70 year range. So that's, um, that's a second bump. And for people in this area who may be walking or gardening, um, buzz off is a great uh, line that has permethrin in it. And that's one that kills the ticks uh, on contact. It's very, very deadly to ticks and it's impregnated in, in the clothes, um, and I think L.O. Bean sells it. And this is what the Army uses to prevent malaria um, in Afghanistan and Iraq and things. They impregnate their uh, uniforms with this. Next. All right. The, I want to go through a little bit about diagnostic dilemmas and some challenges for pediatricians, and this is why I think it's the prevention is so key, because as much as I've tried to learn about Lyme disease, I still miss cases. And there's just, there's just no way that we're going to be perfect at this. Because Lyme disease can be a great masker of many other disease diseases. The easiest way to diagnose this is when the, the bullseye rash is quite obvious. It generally is on day three to seven, but can go as long as, be as long as up to 30 days. Now, keep in mind, a Lyme disease, deer tick bite with a Lyme disease rash, it's the bullseye with the central clearing, and the rash expands. Because sometimes what's the challenge for us is when we get, see a case when a child has a bite that could be something else like, for example, as they say in four here, a black fly bite, and we're seeing it on day two, and we don't have an opportunity to know if the rash has expanded yet or not. 
And so it's much harder for us to diagnose. There's no lab work we can do to do it. And what I say to parents sometimes is, it's not an emergency. Let it, give it a few more days. And if you see the rash actually expanding more and more, let us know. All right. Um, and redness and itchiness, if it's significant enough, points away from Lyme disease. But it doesn't, mild redness and itchiness does not mean that it isn't because remember, when you remove the tick, you're not gonna fully always remove the tick. I've almost never been able to fully remove the tick. Um, and I've almost always left some of the head in. And if you try to remove all the tick, you're just digging. And you don't need to do that because the head is not gonna have the infection. All right, leave it alone. You know, you don't have to dig. But the irritation and redness, the foreign body reaction, can be somewhat annoying at times. Um, next slide. Now, another case that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, um, this is the second stage of Lyme disease called disseminated disease. An eight-year-old girl came to the office with low-grade fever and body aches and a sore throat. On her physical exam, I saw her appeared to be a tiny ulcer in the back of her throat and a diagnosis of early Coxsackie virus was made. Um, she then seemed to improve some, but then relapsed and returned to the office with a unilateral facial droop two weeks later. Full, time, full recovery time was about eight weeks. She fully recovered. She was treated, fully recovered, but it took eight weeks, and a lot of days missed at school. So it is a life-altering experience. And it was very humbling to me because I had written in my initial note, doubt Lyme disease, okay, and my initial note. So um, again, somebody who's seen lots of Lyme can always miss it. Next slide. Late stage disease. Typical story, a child or a teen who has had a temperature on and off around 100, not a, law, a, law, um, a high grade temp, with neck pain, increasing fatigue, and some body aches in the spring, summer, or fall. So what could this be, okay? Well, the child doesn't look that sick, um, but is increasingly fatigued and persistent with the fever. Um, next slide. Lyme meningitis. Now, remember, Lyme meningitis is not bacterial meningitis in the strictest sense. With the use of the mir miraculous vaccines that we have, um, the Hib vaccine, which reduced the cases of, of uh, Hib meningitis from 20,000 cases a year in this country to 200. And believe you me, I was in that era before that vaccine, and every mother knew somebody whose child had been affected by bacterial meningitis. No more <laughs> because of the vaccines. Prevnar and Minactra vaccines have reduced massively the um, 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 meningitis in this country. Not true in Haiti. And I, can, I go to wards and wards of vaccine preventable disease kids who are mentally retarded, deaf, and have seizure disorders as a result of not having the vaccines. So this is not the same type of meningitis. Um, you will know within sometimes less than five hours that your child is extremely sick okay, with bacterial meningitis. You will not know that with Lyme disease as well. And nor will we sometimes. You know, sometimes a child will go to the emergency room, they'll say, well, you know, my neck is a little stiff, so they'll tap the child, and the child will have um, what looks like a viral meningitis. If you live in this town, and it looks like a viral meningitis, it's likely Lyme disease, okay? And in one small study that was performed, there were no long-term damaging effects in children from having Lyme meningitis. They don't get the deafness, they don't get the mental retardation, and they don't have the developmental problems that kids with bacterial meningitis have. Um, but it is still something that takes a lot more treatment and a longer treatment protocol to do. Next one. The swollen knee. Sometimes kids and parents will come into the uh, um, office and say to me, um, my child tripped, and, and, or the kid will say to me, the child will say to me, I tripped and my knee started to swell. Well, what, what seems to happen is, is unintentionally, the physician or the nurse practitioner or the PA can some, be somewhat misled because what happens sometimes is parents and kids equate the trauma with um, the swelling, that the trauma must have happened. And when you really talk in detail, you find out, well, I fell and then 48 hours later my knee swelled, okay? 
which then means that there's really no association between the trauma that was associated with this and, and the actual swelling of the knee. And unless there's trauma that you can directly um, note, a swollen knee in Medfield is Lyme arthritis until proven otherwise, period. All right, and drawing blood here is in fact useful. The, the test will be 95 to 98% accurate at that point. And it's very rare to have bacterial arthritis, uh, extremely rare. I've had one case in my 25 years, and I've probably had 20 cases or 25 cases of Lyme arthritis. And it's in, you know, sometimes when people go to the emergency room, orthopedists open up the joint, they clean it out and things like this. And really with Lyme arthritis, um, unless the picture is very suspicious, it, it, sometimes I think the orthopedists get a little too aggressive. I think a tincture of time can help. And I've seen kids go through having this all done and it really wasn't, you know, if we just started the antibiotics and sat tight for a week or two, things would have gotten better. Um, next slide. Now, this is an interesting, you know, fatigue can fool you, is how I put it, okay? Children will come into the, with a major complaint of fatigue, um, but still often going to school. And parents are worried, I think my kid may have mono, I think my kid may have Lyme disease. So, um, um, and the families are expecting blood work. Well, this can be very misleading, because if you do a Lyme titer at the same time as you do a mono titer, you have a false positive Lyme titer. So I've had seen clinicians call the families and say, you've got Lyme and mono. Well, that's not true. You've got a false positive Lyme with a mono test, with a positive mono. So you have to be really careful about, about you know, when we choose tests that we don't overdo it because we can be falsely misled. Um, and these are some of the faults I've seen through the years. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about myths. The first, as I mentioned before, is I need to remove the entire tick, including the head, or my child will get Lyme disease. No. It's in the abdomen. That's where the deer tick, where the spirochete of Lyme disease lies. If you go to the website that Chris is going to talk about, it'll show you how to remove move the deer tick, and you don't want to squeeze the abdomen when you remove it. You just want to pull it out, and if you leave the head in, it doesn't really matter. All right? My children don't need to check themselves in the winter as there are no ticks then. Not true, as I've just told you. I check my kids every day. They don't need to check themselves. Not true. What I find is, I found that the secondary disease, the arthritis and the meningitis are often in the teenagers. Why? Because parents will say that I've checked my, ch I check my children every day for deer ticks, but never train the children to do it. And what happens around 11 or 12? Do you think your son or daughter's gonna let you come in to the bathroom to look? And uh, again, that's key, and that's where the tick shower card comes in because it's kind of in their face if it's hanging in the bathroom year round. Because then you know that at least it's there for them to look. And it's very important that you train your children at age six. They can understand, they can do it. At age six, they can, they can start looking every night. Um, um, and 20% of, of, of people don't get the bullseye rash. I view that's a little bit of a myth because what I think happens to most of those kids is they have the rash in the scalp and parents don't see it. And I've had kids where I've seen a partial rash, the partial circle sitting here, and, that, that's, um, and, and you know, it was like you can't see the whole circle unless you really pull away the hair. The other type of thing, I had one case one time, very interesting, child got a deer tick bite in the right center of the back. And, you know, we usually view that this is a target lesion. Well, what happened is the child had a thin band and had fever, body aches, and headaches, and had this thin band that started all the way up the sh around the top of the shoulders, all the way down the sides um, in the flank, and down around the legs. <laughs> Um, so you actually had this huge central clearing and only this little band and that was the child had Lyme disease and you know sometimes the rash isn't just the typical picture and that's why sometimes a physician needs to look because these these can look very unusual sometimes as well next slide should I test the tick my opinion is no you talk to Tom Mathers who's the entomologist I've worked with at University of Rhode Island he'll say yes just because a tick, just because um, a deer tick is positive for um, the spirochete of Lyme does not mean you'll get Lyme disease 
or any other co-infection, um, which I'm not really going to discuss a lot tonight. Um, it all comes down to clinical symptoms. That's the bottom line. And anybody who goes and draws blood when kids have either a rash or flu-like symptoms are not treating the child right because the issue is flu-like symptoms in Medfield, regardless of what blood work shows, is Lyme disease until proven otherwise because the, 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 the blood work won't reflect it. In the later stages, I've said, the disseminated and late, on, late stage, you will get a very accurate test then. Next. So here's the basic treatment. Amoxicillin early, um, kids less than eight, doxycycline eight and older, duration 14 to 21 days. Early disseminated, Bell's palsy, um, uh, that occurs 21 days. Arthritis is 28 days, and the meningitis, uh, carditis or severe arthritis, will be IV antibiotics 14 to 28 days. Um, and these are the guidelines by the Infectious Disease Society of, of America that went through a huge lawsuit from Connecticut uh, saying that they were monopolizing um, the treatments because people would keep people on IV ceftriaxone for a year. And the feeling was that's doing more harm than good. And the, um, the uh, settlement in the suit um, basically with an independent, um, uh, um, independent group from the University of Texas basically through shown that this lawsuit was um, showed no credibility. Next. Now, should you prophylax your child for a deer tick bite? You know, there's some guidelines here now about prophylaxing deer tick bites. In my opinion, this all rests on your level of tolerance of risk. Um, in your area, um, uh, somebody who has um, a high deer tick population, the risk from a bite is about one in, one in 30 um, uh, that you'll get Lyme disease and the risk from a, from a bite after being treated with doxycycline within 72 hours is one in 250. Now you can look at it one way and say it's an eightfold difference, but you also have to remember there's side effects with these, you know, stomach upset, allergic reactions. My choice with my kids and me, being somebody that goes to, to Haiti and sees malaria, I, will, I, know, I think one in 30 is fine with me because I know if I see a deer tick bite, that I'm gonna be able to know where the child will develop the rash. And what I need to do is look there, okay? Some parents call us and insist on the antibiotic and we say fine, but that's their level of risk and they have to understand that there are some risks from giving, giving an antibiotic as well. And some parents still want it and we give it because I think your level of risk is your decision of tolerance, not ours. Next. So, I just want to briefly talk about insect repellents because people are very worried about toxicity. And more on that, more on that, uh, Chris will talk about. But these are the different forms. The one in the top left hand side is DEET. Very common. Deep woods off, 25, 20 to, 25 to 30% deep woods off. Lasts three to eight hours. And, you know, um, it should be applied to exposed areas to kids and on their clothes. Um, parents worry about the long-term effects of the toxicity from this. Um, the data seems pretty clear that this is pretty safe. But then also, the science of toxicology isn't always the best. However, when I was in Haiti for years, I was using 100% DEET because I, I didn't want to get malaria. But then again, um, I found that you can use 25% and be fine. The reason there were scares years ago, there were very rare cases of intractable seizure disorders that develop. So as a result, that may be related to DEET in an extremely tiny number of people, but it gave DEET a bad rap and it's still kind of perpetuated itself since then. Then you have your other things, your citronella, your eucalyptus uh, repellents, and it doesn't work very long. Um, and then you have your repellents that Tom Mathers talks about. We have something at the front desk there called Sawyer's, which you don't put directly on your body. You put on your clothes and you put on your shoes. And it's pretty amazing how quickly it'll kill the tick. But the one problem you have to be careful is it'll kill cats. It won't hurt dogs because dogs um, actually get shampoos with this. <coughs> but it will kill cats. Next slide. And interesting enough, most of the time deer ticks don't like cats. They don't like to um, attach to cats that much. They much more like dogs. So this is what I look at for pesticide safety, and this is more confusing to me than ever. Thank you. You know, so I, I'm not a toxicologist, so I can't make comments on this, but what they talk about is if you're going to use it, get a licensed person to do it. Um, let me see the next one. Has. Next slide. Finally, 
what I say is, and you can get Daminex tick tubes that will then um, have permethrin in it. And I don't have a picture, so I apologize. And you can um, put them in your yard, and the mice will take the permethrin lace cotton and put it in their nest because the mice are what transmit it to the deer. And if you kill the um, uh, ticks on the mice in the nest, it will reduce the exposure to the deer that then cycle to us. Okay. But this was, I found a, Dr. Mathers had a poster, wasn't quite, this isn't quite as nice, but I say, what kind of lime do you want? So um, he had this sitting up there with the uh, apple martini with the lime versus the, uh, the deer tick. So um, let, next slide. Um, that's it. Um, I do have on our, our website a 10 minute vid, um, video um, that, we have, that I have discussing Lyme disease. So um, that's our website there, and feel free to take a look at it um, um, because um, we have about 30 videos on there that the pediatricians have done at Westwood Mansfield Pediatrics. So um, thank you. Um, I think, Chris, you're going to go next, and we'll have questions. Is that what we're doing? Um, if someone has, has had Lyme on more than one occasion, diagnosis, how is treated, um, is the test valid on another occurrence? You know, it depends on the, oh, thank you. If somebody has a recurrent line, is the test valid, you know, if you draw the test later, uh, again? Okay, no. Case of right. 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 Well, there are two forms of, there's three different types of tests that you can do. Uh, the commonest one is um, um, the ELISA test. And that will show what's called IgM and IgG. Now, you have to have a certain number of bands, and how, how those bands are interpreted can be pretty complicated, so I oftentimes call my infectious disease associates at Children's to get an interpretation of what they think. Um, but those sometimes can be very difficult to interpret because sometimes people will keep their Lyme titers for a very long time, and that's not reflective of disease. It's like, you'd be surprised, uh, six months to even a year after somebody has mono, their mono test will still remain positive even though they have no symptoms of disease. So that's why you have to be very careful, assuming that you know, uh, six months later with fatigue, you draw blood work, and they could have had mono six months before. So you have to be careful with that. There are other tests you can do to be more specific. You know, uh, PCR, polymerase chain reactions, can give you more specifics than that. It's a lot more expensive and not usually used as much. The Western blot is the one that's in between. But even that, because of the band situation, uh, is difficult to interpret. And I, like I say, if I have recurrent ones, I uh, defer to my infectious disease uh, associates with that. Other questions? In the back there. I've been told by my children's pediatrician that the tick has to be on for at least 24 hours to transmit. How true is that? Um, that's true. 24 to, depends on what you read in the literature, 24 to 48. Some will say 36. So some of us say 36 because it's right in between 24 and 48. So um, yes, and, and you know, a lot of times too, if you go to a website Chris is going to talk about, you can see what an engorged deer tick looks like. And that's something that can be helpful for you to see, you know, because most of the time you don't have a sense of how long it's been on. You know, you, you really don't because you look at it and you say, oh, I just see it because you're not going to wait 48 hours. You know, you're going to take it off when you can. Yes? When you see a deer tick bite, is there always a tick still there? Or no. Be a bite and the tick's gone? Nope. nope. It gets its blood meal and then it pulls, it pulls out. There'll be a central, sometimes punctate lesion there. Okay, you'll see a little punctate lesion and you'll see a white clearing around that, then the red ring. Okay. Because sometimes the ring shows up later, like just the bite itself would just look like a little red. Well, and in and, and a bite, like I said, you get a foreign body reaction. We'll get parents call us a day, two days after a bite and say it's really red around here as Lyme started or even 24 hours. And we'll say, and it's itchy, and I'll say, no, that's a foreign body reaction. It's day three to seven generally, and three to 30 generally of when the actual true bullseye rash will come out. Yeah, there'll be the puncture, and then it'll have the central clearing in the ring. Yes, back there again. How long does it take to clear? How long does Lyme disease take to clear? No, how long does the ring take to disappear? It's, it's interesting because I've asked that question to several, several specialists in this area, and there's kind of a range of opinion. I don't think there's great data on this, but, you know, they're always telling us to wait to see if the rash expands, so we can sometimes distinguish a black fly bite. Um, my opinion and my experience, it can stay around 
as long as five or six days, but go away within 48 hours at times too. So it's, you know, and that's my experience, but I have no hard data to, to say definitively that's what it is. But for example, if you have a child that you notice an irregular ring on their scalp and you think that maybe it's been there before, keep an eye on it for a week and if it's still there, it's probably not. Yeah, if you knew that the ring was, you gotta know how long the ring's been there prior. <laughs> you know, and so if it looks, if it's a flat ring, red ring, and it's flat, okay, not like um, sometimes what you get with um, um, ringworm or something called granuloma annulare that are not flat. If it's flat and you, don't, you can't feel it, it's more, I'd be more concerned living in this region that could be Lyme. So I probably wouldn't wait very long with that um, if it's a true ring. Because a lot of the black fly bites, they're hard to tell if there's a central clearing or not. But if it's not subtle, <laughs> don't wait. Yes? Typically, do see one bullseye, or could a child have multiple yeah, ones related to the same bite? Yes, there can be multiple. That's a, like a disseminated stage. I really didn't go into that much. But that can have multiple rings around. But they have gone through the initial stage. And then they have something called erythema chronica migrans. And that's, that's a, a disseminated disease stage, which takes a little longer to treat. But that is possible um, as well. And sometimes parents wonder, did, did my child get multiple bites? And the answer is no. And we see probably one case a year like that. So uh, we don't see a lot, but we see maybe one that's erythema chronica migrans. Anyone else? Yes? If your child, if you see a tick on your child, or you know if your child has a bite, you pull the tick out, there's no reaction, no ring, no pain, nothing irregular about your child, you're fine. Well, it depends on, do you know how long the, the bite's been there, the tick has been there, you know, and that's the challenge. I mean, more likely you're going to know that when your kids are young if you're giving them baths nightly. Um, but if they're older kids, you're not going to know. So I still would look in the region for three, three to seven days, but keep in mind if my child has fever and flu-like symptoms in the first 30 days, um, you know, I'm going to talk to the pediatrician because this could be Lyme. Yes, ma'am. What if the symptoms were very minor? What's the risk of it not being diagnosed? Well, you know, and as I said before up on the slide, 50% of people will get Lyme and it'll go away without being treated at all. I don't suggest doing that um, because 50% will go into secondary disease. So um, um, the risk of mild disease and not picking it up is pretty darn tiny. I mean, if you see the cases I didn't pick up, what the, and these are ones, actual ones I didn't pick up, the child with the throat, you know, with it, um, she actually got better and then got worse again. So it was very, again, a great masker and very deceptive. It's very humbling because I've had this happen a few times and uh, you feel pretty guilty. So uh, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. According to what Dr. Steer has told me, who's one of the gurus in this, no. No, you don't, get, you don't develop resi um, any resistance. Yes? Does it get worse than if you've been exposed? I'm like older, so exposed multiple times. Because a lot of doctors still do not accept Lyme disease. So you may go in and say you think you would have it. My understanding is, is the... Um, Severity of the disease, regardless of the age, but then I'm not an expert in adults, okay, in, in older adults, um, is more dependent on the duration of time somebody has had the disease unrecognized than really on um, the frequency of the times, that, the, the, the number of times they've had Lyme. Okay, so we ought to give Chris an opportunity here. And if there are any other, I'm happy to talk. We could panel up here. So, Chris, take it away. Hi, can you hear me? If I keep this down, maybe I should hold it. I'm Chris Caldy, and um, I want to start just by saying I've been in Medfield 13 years, and I rock, walk in Rocky Woods all the time. I've never gotten Lyme. It is possible to be active outdoors in town and not get Lyme. Um, I don't want, I not, and part of my reason to be active on uh, Lyme disease education is because it, I think it's terrible that people fear going outside. So I'm glad you're here to um, learn about Lyme and how to uh, protect yourself. You joined Dr. Hartman's regional Lyme committee, which he started about five, six years ago. And I'm not a scientist, or nor, nor have I had Lyme, but I've learned everything 
I'm going to tell you tonight from uh, being part of that committee. And uh, so I thought I'd start, this is a slide that uh, Dr. Hartman already showed that indicates how dark Norfolk County is and uh, that it is a real issue in our town. And in case you don't know, Lyme is named after the town in Connecticut where a cluster of cases occurred in 75, 1975, and that's, uh, it was named after that, those, the incidents is there. I thought it best to just go over the uh, habitat, of, a little background on ticks, and then that helps understand how to prevent and protect your yard as well. Uh, ticks like woody, brushy areas. Uh, they're looking for small mammals to attach to mice or large mammals like deer. They love moist and humid environments. New England provides a lot of humidity in the summer, great, great place for ticks. They are found at the ground level and up to about maybe your three feet, maybe knee or thigh high. Um, that's where they hang out. And as Dr. Hartman mentioned, there are good and bad years for ticks. It depends on the weather. Some years it's too dry, they don't do well, they don't find a lot of meals. Some years it's very wet and they do better. Here's a photo of an um, adult female. They are red and brown. They're slightly larger than males. Uh, the males are all dark. And that becomes uh, notable only because um, females carry the disease, not the males. However, when they're on you and they're small, it's hard to tell which, which you have. So um, ticks feed uh, once in each stage of their lives. Uh, as mentioned before, they start out as a larva. In the uh, late summer, they'll look for mice or small rodents and birds to feed on, and that's how they pick up lime. Then they uh, are quiet over the winter, and in the spring, the nymph emerges, and again, it's looking for another blood meal. Again, same, same group of animals, and ourselves, of course, dogs, and then also potentially larger mammals. They are looking for a host to walk by. The ticks don't jump on you. They actually hang out on low branches and grasses, and they, they are sensing a host going by. They have different sensors, and they attach. So when you brush against the grass, you brush against the brush, that's how it gets on your body. In the... Um, fall, they turn into adults, and they need to feed again, and they choose at that point large animals, uh, namely deer. Uh, however, each time they feed, they may not get infected. Uh, who, it depends what they're feeding on, and, but once they acquire it, they uh, infect their next host. The photo at the bottom shows a, an engorged female, and a female next to a male, and an engorged nymph, and the nymph, which is really about the size of a pinhead, maybe a little bigger. They're small. The favorite food and transportation of adult ticks is deer. The photo on the right, uh, Dr. Hartman mentioned the, what a deer can look like. I'm not quite sure the angle of the head of the deer, but um, you can see all the ticks that are stuck on it. Uh, and that's not uncommon, apparently. So the main host for an adult tick is deer. We um, have a high deer population, so we have a very good uh, place for ticks to feed. And be, if um, and so they're able to, if they get through their first two cycles of their life, they have no problem getting their third meal and then being able to finish their cycle, lay their next thousands of eggs, and um, continue the cycle. Uh, and I'm just mentioned deer are responsible for moving ticks around. They don't travel far, ticks on their own. They rely on uh, animals for transportation. Uh, quickly, why is this such an issue now? Um, basically what I just said, ticks are very well fed in our area because we have a lot of deer. And our increasing deer herds are due to the um, development that Dr. Hartman mentioned. Their, their habitat has been squeezed. We see them more because they're, we feed them with our plantings. Um, there's certainly a reduction of natural predators. We don't have wolves, coyotes, and bear. 
uh, and also our, our laws, our bylaws in this town in particular, we've outlawed shooting, so uh, hunting is very limited, and hunting has become limited anyways because we have so much development, there's much smaller parcels, so it squeezes out the opportunity areas to uh, hunt. Um, does average two, maybe three fawns a year, so the population definitely increases uh, pretty quickly. And uh, we have learned through our, the experts taught, who've come to the regional Lyme committees that it has been shown that a lower deer population correlates to a lower incidence of Lyme disease cases because the tick population decreases. Other myths, this was kind of fun to put together. Deer carry Lyme disease. No, that's not true, but apparently people do think that. We know that ticks carry it. Ticks fly and jump on you. Once again, no, they, you brush against them or they get onto you from your animals or um, other exposure. They don't jump on you from trees and bushes. You can get Lyme from your dog. That's my vet telling me that she hears that often. And no, you can't get Lyme from your dog. You can pick up a tick, a tick that's not attached, but you're not gonna get Lyme from your dog. Ticks travel across yards. The concern, gee, I'm controlling my own property, but my neighbor isn't. What, what you know, is that a concern? No, they don't. The way they travel is on rodents and you can't control that um, particularly. So you can control your own space though in terms of uh, some protection, which I'll get to. Ticks die in winter. We've uh, shown that they have a two-year life cycle. They just go dormant. They're, they're out there. As soon as it's a warm day, you'll f I'll find a tick uh, traveling around. All ticks carry Lyme. No, that's not true. Um, only females do, and according to our, the experts again, there's a question, but maybe, um, what did I write? One in four ticks, 20-25 percent of ticks carry Lyme. So if you get one on you, like Dr. Hartman in his experiment, it doesn't mean you're going to get Lyme. There's a good chance you won't. And lastly, uh, you can't get Lyme again, and no, that's not true. You can get bitten again. You, we don't develop resistance. All right, so now into the protection. The biggest thing you can do is check for ticks every day. Um, we've out front provided some uh, the cards from the uh, Westwood Pediatrics that show in particular for little kids where to check but again you know it's the hairline your ears I found one in my infant years ago in his little ear fold um, just uh, under uh, the back what do they say the, your neck um, of course under your arms the groin back and knees also feel your scalp uh, secondly, wear light-colored clothes, long sleeves, and if you dare, tuck your pants into your socks when you're outside. Um, avoid high-risk areas, and those include high grass, fields, wooded areas, leaf piles, that's a big one. Um, stay on trails when you're in rocky woods or wherever. Uh, repellent, uh, Dr. Hartman covered this. Um, I do spray myself with DEET freely. I'll go out. Uh, when I'm going into the woods. I don't do it all the time by any means, but I will use spray myself with DEET. Um, I don't worry about it. I think the consequences of Lyme are far worse than, than uh, some DEET on my skin. Uh, and permethrin, I did want to speak about that. There are clothes available, as he mentioned, that are impregnated that you can buy that called uh, Insect Shield or Buzz Off. These are great. You can buy a shirt and shorts for your kid going to camp and not worry about it so much. Um, you can also make your own. I left out front a can of Sawyer's. This is one brand of um, permethrin that you can buy. And you can soak your own clothes and it lasts through many sh washings. Or you can just spray your shoes, for example. And, but you just don't want to spray your clothing while you're wearing it. That's, that's um, not, not good. Uh, lastly, natural repellent. I did just this week learn about uh, one made with cedar oil. And um, again, it's a question of its effectiveness. I've heard, more than, I've heard a person say they swear by it. It works. They, even, they spray their dog, their golden retriever who they tend to pick up a lot of ticks in the woods and this guy says it really keeps them from attaching 
Um, it might be worth a try, but I, I uh, can't speak to it, its effectiveness. Uh, more personal perfection, uh, protection. Know the symptoms. The summertime flu is concerning. Use pointy tweezers. I've got a picture there. Not your standard plucking tweezers. They really need to be pointed in order to grab the tick low enough against your skin and you're supposed to pull steady, steady uh, and slowly um, to hopefully avoid breaking the tick and disinfect the area. What I recommend is putting a note in your calendar the day you pull it off, and then just watch, see what happens, if anything happens. Um, but you know, if I don't write things down, I never remember. So if you write it down, pull, you know, tick in your calendar, you can keep that in mind if, if flu symptoms start or anything else. Um, this was something Dr. Hartman had said to our group and that I thought was important, is tell your doctor we live in a very high risk area and if they aren't sympathetic I vote go to a new doctor because you want to get treated it is not something it's simple you know doxycycline it, it shouldn't be an argument you should be able to get treated and lastly the site tickencounter.org is very useful um, for pictures of ticks you mentioned something Lisa oh, lawn treatments there's No, lots, yeah, protecting your yard, yourself, and your pets. It's, it has a lot of uh, good information, well done. There's, a, there's um, also proper tick removal is covered, and the safety of uh, permethrin is discussed. And of course, the biggest thing, to tick check every day. Property management, here's a quick, and I have a second slide. So simple things you can do yourself, create a three foot, barrier around your lawn where, where it meets the woods. Big thing is clearing brush and leaf litter. You want to keep down the uh, places where ticks hide. Keep your grass low. Um, and I don't mean necessarily your lawn grass. They don't like lawns in general, but you don't want the edge. If you have a larger piece of property, you might have some higher grass. You don't want that high grass. Keep your wood piles and bird feeders away from your house. and. Uh, also pruning your bushes and plants that are low-lying and around stone walls in order to get more sunlight in. This all will help reduce uh, the number of ticks around your house. Next. Uh, also, um, use plants that don't attract deer. You can get a list at Lovells. They have one readily available. You can look that up online. In t it was interesting this winter, despite the amount of snow we got, we did not lose the bushes that we normally do. So I don't know what the difference was this year. Um, I would have expected whether, maybe because there were a lot of acorns, the deer were well fed in the fall, I don't know. Uh, spraying, that, uh, you can have a licensed applicator come and spray the perimeter of your yard. I hear it's very effective. I've never done this, but um, I would just make sure it's a licensed applicator. That would be a landscaper or a tree expert. And then the tick tubes. Now, this is, uh, these are considered very effective in um, keeping tick numbers down. These, I believe, were developed by Dr. Mather at, at um, tickencounter.org, his site. They're, as Dr. Hartman mentioned, they're simply cotton balls soaked in permethrin that are in cardboard tubes. I believe that's all they really are. And if you put them in, um, the area where mice will habit, uh, ha like to hang out. Your stone walls are a big one, wood piles, foundations, um, dense flower beds. They will use the material to line their beds and then what happens is the ticks, when they, at the smallest stage, when they're looking for their blood meal, they will be repelled by the, the oil, uh, the permethrin on the mice, mouse's fur will repel them and they won't be able to eat and then they die. So it's very effective, minor effort. Just spread them out in your yard. They um, need to be replaced each year. And uh, let's see. It's also doesn't harm the mice or other animals, but it has been shown to be effective. We as the town committee are hoping to soon put up online uh, a link from the town website 
we're going to create a page about Lyme and prevention, and I hope to have instructions on making your own. But basically, you should be saving your toilet paper rolls, because that's what you need to make these. So, dog protection. Uh, this information, my uh, close friend from college is a vet who owns Randolph Animal Hospital, so she's my source. And there's my son and dog in a very high-risk area, having a great time. Um, First off, cats don't get Lyme, but they can carry ticks, and they can get other tick-borne diseases. So that's why they, they don't get vaccinated, but they should, you should use the topical product on your, on your cat. They also, um, yeah, they can carry them in your home to you. The big thing that um, is recommended is vaccination, and, this, and to do it as early as you can. It's very effective. The, vaccine, not the, uh, apparently there are a few types out there, but she thinks the recombinant DNA-based one is very effective, unlike the older one, which had killed organisms in it. So um, the way it works, it's, it's unique. In other, when the tick attaches to your pet, it's sucking in first for a blood meal, and the antibodies of the vaccine that are in the dog are taken in by the tick, and it kills the Lyme spirochete before the tick has a chance to transmit it to the dog. So it's very effective. Um, she has never seen Lyme in a dog that she has vaccinated. So the issue, if you will, is that your eight-week-old puppy, you might want to keep out of tick areas until you can get, till he grows up to 12 weeks. She also recommends checking annually when you have your heart, dog's heartworm test, assuming you take your dog annually in for um, a checkup. There is a test on the market that covers heartworm, covers Lyme, covers a couple other tick-borne diseases. So you can easily have your dog checked. Uh, and if there's an issue, the dog can be treated. Uh, use your topical products. Frontline and Vectra are most effective. Um, I did learn not long ago that you, when you apply it, you need to be sure it's not right before a dog bath or right after. In other words, you need to leave a couple days before and after because the oils on the dog's for skin help to spread it uh, on its skin, so you want to uh, just avoid the bath time. I used to think, oh, I just bathe the dog, I'll put it on. I gotta, you got to wait a couple days. And to be diligent about using the topicals uh, once a month or as, as directed on the um, package. Other diseases that ticks carry are out there. They're very rare. My old dog did pick up one of those, however. Um, his symptoms were fatigue, if I remember right, and it was caught, he was treated the babesiosis, but she said they're actually not common at all in our area, unlike Lyme. Um, however, ehrlichiosis, she says, does come in from dogs from other, from Puerto Rico in particular. I gather if you adopt a dog from the south, a lot of them, the little dogs might come from Puerto Rico and they often carry that with them. Uh, next thing is to groom your dog. I use a flea, flea comb to check my dog after in the woods, and a uh, big thing is to pay attention to any lameness. That uh, Lyme can have a range of presentations, but uh, a limp is a, is, can, is a common symptom as well as a fever, uh, and it could be multiple joints or single joint with that joint pain. And she says dogs can get the bullseye rash, but of course that would be pretty hard to see. Um, and I have a couple slides to close. Um, the Regional Lyme Disease Committee, I just want to mention that this Dr. Hartman started and we as a group uh, put on three public forums over the last few years, one in Westwood, two here in Medfield. And that's, I've learned a lot from this effort. We've provided hands-on education um, from being at the Medfield Day Board of Health booth to providing, uh, educating, talking to coaches of teams, to the park and rec people, to, um, trying to think what else, um, to, Lisa's taught students in the primary grades directly. I've talked to the scouts. But our biggest, biggest um, accomplishment was expanding the school curriculum and implementing it here in Medfield. This, uh, we need to recognize Nancy Schemer, the uh, Wheelock nurse, and Susan Cowell, the health educated, educator. They um, put this together, and it's now 
Lyme curriculum is being taught in a coordinated approach, and your kids will hear this in kindergarten, first, third, fifth, seventh, and ninth grade, a class on the odd years, and in 12th grade in one elective, and then also on the other years, they will get it covered in a unit uh, such as outdoor safety or first aid. So we're very pleased that we know our children are being taught about this every year. Uh, wish it could be even off more often, but at least we know it's in the curriculum. And um, in twice in the primary grades, they receive the shower card that you saw outside with the, with the stick figure that Dr. Hartman's practice created. That was. Um, thanks to the Medfield Coalition for Public Education, they printed those and laminated them, and so they were provided to our kids this past year. It's hoping, they're hoping it's gonna be in the budget next year. I doubt it will make it, so that will need some other form of funding, most likely. And uh, I just wanna mention the regional committee has basically dissolved. We feel we've, we've run our course, and it really takes, uh, Dr. Hartman tried very hard to get different towns involved. We had West, definitely Westwood and Millis involved, but Sharon came in and out, and so um, you'll be hearing more from us in the near future. I was, and I was elected chair. We are looking at other towns also. We're studying what other towns have done in order to be sure that whatever we do is most effective. And this was the phrase that uh, Lisa Dolan of the committee came up with, brush your t teeth, check for ticks, to get used to saying that to your children at bedtime, that um, it's uh, important to do both. So, And lastly, I have a slide with resources. If uh, there's the Tick Encounter site and a few others that you can find information. So. Um, I hope you feel more empowered and not afraid to be outside. You can, it's a fact of life in the Northeast, and um, you can safely coexist with Lyme. Thank you. Are there any questions for me or Dr. Lester? Yeah. I I don't believe they do. My understanding is they don't travel from Dr. Um, Sam Telford, who's an expert on ticks. They only travel within a, you know a two foot area, be it up or laterally, and so I don't. The way they travel is via transportation, a rodent or something. And so maybe if a mice crawls through there, a tick would land there. If, you know, but I don't think the tick is crawling into it. Would you agree? Right. I think it's going to be dependent on, you know, it wants to be on a mammal of some type. And it's, it's going to, it's, that's the vector. And, you know, if it's trying to get its blood meal at the time, it's going right. to want to be on and clinging to that rodent or mammal. So I think you're safe would be my conclusion there. How long do they live on things? Let's say one did get on there or got in your house, maybe on clothes without a brush shop. How long do they live just without a meal? Yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Sam Telford said like at most 24 hours because they just dehydrate. You know, they need moisture and things and your house is too dry. So just so to repeat that um, for the, for the recording that we think maybe about 24 hours that ticks live, that's all because they dehydrate. Yes. I actually uh, learned somewhere that if you throw your clothes in a dryer because they don't like, that would be high for them. So that's another thing. Oh, that's a good tip, to throw your clothes in the dryer to dehydrate them, yeah. Maybe in the heat. That yeah, makes sense. The it's the dryness, yes, that, that uh, kills them. Yes? My is on the edge of the yard. My husband wants to move it like back to the middle of the yard. <laughs> But if there's three feet behind the swing set, are we generally safe? Because they're not going to like jump out of the trees. So right, it's more. It's okay there as long as they give it a good cushion between. Yeah. That's my understanding. Would you agree? Yeah, I think you to create a barrier there. You know, like a three-foot barrier, like wood chips or something. Cause yeah. They don't walk across the wood chips. They're going to die before they can make them across. Okay. So I was going to go that last one, play mulch, like with that. Over that. Uh, around the edge, sure, that would be good.
Yeah, it could be stones, it can be mulch, it can be the plastic, uh, just, just that border. You want to differentiate from the wood. So like Dr. Hartman said, the ticks can't, they won't survive getting over to the other area. And if your grass is low cut, yeah. you, know, you know, for the swing set, I wouldn't be too concerned with you. Your question's right, you know, the roads that come through there, but if they're not brushing against things that the tick can fall off on, then they're not really going to get there. Right, I'm going to mulch the whole area. I just wanted to make sure that just the three feet was enough for, you know, being that close together. Yeah, I would say so. And sunlight's good too, if it's in a sunny spot. Yes? Um, I have a question about, you had mentioned that sometimes in the early tests you could come up with a false positive, and you mentioned mono, was, or testing for mono might be one of the reasons. What are some of the other reasons why a child might test falsely in that initial um, ELISA test? And then what, what do you, what, what's the next course? Then do they do those second two tests that you mentioned, the Western blot and the PCP and PCR? PCR. And then I, those come back negative, are you okay? Well, I think number one with the false positive, what you do is um, um, you can repeat the test maybe in a month and hopefully it will be gone. You know, number one. Um, I'm trying to remember what we did because we talked to the ID people, in fact, these people about this before. Um, the challenge is, is most of these are done at the state level. So sometimes the state, you can't dictate what they're going to do. They, you know, um, but if, if they, you know what, I have to look that up. I don't have a full answer for you. Good question. I don't have a full answer. There's something I just wanted to mention. Um, yeah. Bird feeders. Any kind of any situation you have around your house is going to probably bring rodents. So the, the ideal thing is to keep bird feeders or any kind of feeding station away from your home, away from your play area. Right. You get spillage and it's a good thing to move your bird feeders. I think that was up there too, away from your play areas. Well, I want to thank you for all coming out. I know it's a busy week. There's a lot going on. And I, um, if you have any th other questions, we're here. Thank you. Production support provided by Medfield.tv. Access to our community.